Maybe, and here we are. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Welcome to Highlands to Islands. This is week two of our discussion of stills. Uh, joining us uh, currently are uh, Maggie Campbell from Privateer Rum and our, our good friend, uh, the head of maturing whiskey, whiskey stocks of the Glenmorangie Company, Brendan McCarran. Uh, thank you both for being a part of this discussion. We should be joined by Lou Bryson here shortly. Um, last week, we talked quite a lot about uh, Maggie's background as a brewer and distiller, uh, as a distiller of brandies first and uh, first, and then rums now. Uh, the still setup uh, at Privateer, a, a unique setup there. Uh, and this week, uh, we'll want to sort of start by talking a bit about with Brendan about what he thinks the the sort of the top line differences between the still configurations at Glenmorangie and Ardbeg are. So I'm going to turn it over to Brendan for that description. Okay, so just the stills, nothing else, not the just just for now, and then and then we can get into uh, condensers, and and we'll have an entire uh, actually next week devoted to the fermentation phase. So mm -hmm. um, just for now, uh, the stills and condensation uh, for now. Sure. So still wise, um, the most obvious one, and no one will fall off their seat hearing this, but Glenmorangie have the tallest copper pot stills of any distillery in Scotland. So Glenmorangie have super tall stills, and they're actually quite small in volume. So they'll hold about 11,000, 12,000 litres of wash in the wash still. Um, and then even though they're pretty much the same size and they're exactly the same size in height, but volume-wise, the spirit stills will hold like 7,000 litres. So <clears throat> a very small batch at the bottom of those stills, huge long necks, massive amount of copper contact. That's the biggest difference at Glenmorangie. Heated by pans in the wash still, coils in the spirit still, so nothing crazy there. Um, but when you go to Ardbeg, Ardbeg, well, oh, one other sort of interesting thing for Glenmondry, and I'm breaking the rules here, Dan. You said you wouldn't mention condensers, but you didn't say anything oh. about famous tanks, did you? Oh, you no, I didn't. I did not say <laughs> anything about that. So another interesting thing with Glenmondry is a balanced operation, but we do share a faints tank between two sets of stills. So that is maybe a little variable, which I think probably in the future I want to change, but as that's... It's a long way off in the future. Now, Ardbeg, Ardbeg has, you know, just one of these, <clears throat> of many distilleries in Scotland, these quirks that have happened over the years, just acquiring equipment over time. But with Ardbeg, you have this crazy thing. Hey, Lou, you have this crazy thing at Ardbeg where the spirit still is bigger in volume than the wash still. So if you know anything about distillation, in fact, if you know only one thing, about distillation is that each time you do it, you get less, you know? You're distilling <laughs> down the product. Thank you, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> By our big, the first distillation is smaller than the next still. So what you do at our big, so our stills are quite small. They're very bulbous. They're quite big and broad, you know? Um, the, the process is you do two wash distillations to get enough um, low wines to do one spirit distillation. So that's not very talked about, but that's a huge difference. And it's still a balance. It's still a balance, still operation, but it's a two to one balance as opposed to a one to one balance. And then, of course, the really famous thing at our big. So we don't have a lot of copper contact. We don't have a lot of reflux. Complete opposite of Glenmondry. Huge amount of copper contact, huge amount of reflux. But our big, just to add a little bit to it, to give it a little shine, a little polish. Um, we have a purifier on the spirit still. So only distillery on Isla that has a spirit uh, that has a purifier, and only one of I think it's fourteen or fifteen from trying to work out in my head um, stills in Scotland that have a purifier. Very cool. Um, now you had mentioned um, the the faints receiver, which I hadn't really even thought about. Um, does that mean that there are six faints receivers? At Glamorangie, then, uh, so each each pair of stills feeds one, or do all the spirits? Or, I mean, do is it one huge faints receiver? No, no, no. So if you had if you had one huge faints receiver, that'd do something cool, but not Glenmorangie. That's Klein Leash. So Klein Leash faints. We we call them faints. You know, we we, we call faints like this. Uh, 
mono liquid that has no differences in it. But actually, you know, it's as varied as like the house at the start of um, an MTV reality show. So there's all sorts of weird, crazy things in there. Um, and it's like the Big Brother house to do a, a slightly more modern reality TV show. I see our big Cam looking very confused. <laughs> so what happens is when you have when you have like just one big faint tank, eventually you're going to get settling. You know, you're going to get heavier, oilier stuff. You're going to get some heavier stuff sinking the bottom. Some oils coming out of solution and rising to the top. And actually, you get <clears throat> oxidation. You get some anaerobic processes going on in there, okay. and you with waxy spirit character and that's coin leash and a few other places that you get that but what we have is it's kind of like, do you call it the same in america do you call it like the three-legged race you know when you tie two kids legs together and they put their arms around each other and they go to run you know it's a yeah. like that you have two sets of stills feeding one faint receiver but because it's a reasonably quick operation i'm comfortable with it on a quality level but I just, in terms of efficiency, you kind of have, this still could go. This still could take some wash and go, but it needs to wait for this one to then start the operation again so that they kind of fire like a couple of pistons. Understood. Um, and so, Lou, thanks a lot for joining us. This is Lou Bryson. He's the, uh, the author not only of Tasting Whiskey, but of this fascinating book, uh, Whiskey Masterclass, right there. Uh, we're honored to have you here, sir. Um one of the things that I wanted to ask you just in general about is what you think, I mean, it, let's take the peat out of the equation and just talk about, and it's, I know that's, uh, that's uh, for, uh, for consumers. It's a little bit hard to wrap your brain around, but if you, if you had to sort of describe the organoleptic differences, uh, taking the peat away from the new make coming out of an Ardbeg still and the new make coming out of a Glenmore still, cause you've been to both. Um, where do you think the significant differences there uh, are you're asking me or Brendan? Yeah, yeah, Lou. Yeah, if you mean, <laughs> just, sorry, yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, uh, Peter White. Um, I mean, I, I feel that the um, the Ardbeg Spirit, even though it's, um, I mean, it's not a it's not a heavy distillate, but it's 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 significantly heavier than Glenmorangie. That's the main the main thing I'm feeling. I mean, you're getting a um, like a whole different set of uh, of aromas. You're getting a, a but I, mostly it's going to come down to that just the weight of it, the mm -hmm. slipperiness on the tongue. And yeah. so, uh, Brendan, does that is that does that come down to cut point? I mean, not not just cut point, but how much does cut point have to do with? with that perception or is that entirely because of still configuration uh height uh, uh, line arm purifier yes this is the <clears throat> excuse me this is the the beauty of whiskey so everything's multi-variable so that's why it is a science but it will always be a combination of science and art art sounds cool it just means stuff we don't know uh, so i don't know is the answer. Um, it's, there's lots of variables play into it, but I think one in particular, even before we get into that still, we're using wooden washbacks. Mm. So with backs, we've got some Britannomyces is in there, there's no doubt. Um, you've got a little bit of sort of just, it's just a non-stereo beginning for the yeast that drops in there and you have some sort of unique flora and fauna and we pick up that difference almost immediately and we've done some trials, you know, putting it into a little bit of stainless steel. So I think that already adds some different congeners which show up as that kind of heavier. Um, and I'm with Lou, he said it's, it's heavy. It's not the heaviest, but it's heavier than Glenmorangie. So as opposed to saying oily, I think of it more as soapy. I think you get this kind of soapy, waxy, oily thing in there. It's not super oily, but there is a depth. There's a, there's a bit of presence to it. And then in terms of the, the, the stills we use, absolutely. I think if we wanted to make our big bigger and chunkier, we'd probably switch off the, the purifier. And, I, and I'd probably, not so much the cut points. I, I'd probably keep the cut points where you want, if you like. Turn the heat up, you know? Mm. Use a good Scottish term. Horse them on. Horse on the stills. Get them going. Like, come on. Kentucky Derby it. 
and then that would probably get you a little bit more of a heavier character in there. But if you really wanted to go crazy, take that that cut from heart spirit into faints and tails, and just nudge it a bit towards the faints. That'd be another way. Okay. So, Maggie, at your place, uh, we had talked last week a bit about the different uh, uh, bits of kit that you use in order to uh, encourage or discourage uh, reflux. But we didn't necessarily talk about, and Bren uh, brings up a point I've been I've been researching recently, uh, which is temperature gradients in a still. Uh, how how quickly you get there, and where where you sit? Uh, do you do you just low and slow, or do you just do you pound it? Do you horse it a bit? Um, do you guys, uh, and I forgot to ask you last week about uh, fermentation medium, do you guys ferment in steel, I'm guessing, at Privateer, is that right? We ferment in stainless steel, but we don't do a sterile ferment, and we do a six-day fermentation, so we get a really good bacterial rest. We want that pH drop. Um, that's really important to us, and then we also have agitators in all of our fermenters to keep all the yeast in suspension, which of course increases a lot of specific esters we're looking for. Um, in particular, you know, in rum, that rose petal aroma is a big one. Um, and if mm. you agitate and are aware of your nitrogen, you can absolutely coax that out. So yeah, we get most of our primary fermentation done in two to three days, but then we'll do the last couple days of autolytic sort of development, as well as that pH drop that we really want to see, um, that sourness comes through. And then of course that organic acidity becomes really important in distillation and then later in aging. So we use a blend of yeast. We do inoculate, obviously yeast super well accounted for to make sure none of them are combative and they get along well. Super important to always mention that to new distillers. Um, and, but we do allow natural yeast to play a role, but, um, we are located near a lot of apple orchards and apples can have a bloom on them that has yeast that are known for creating a lot of sulfury notes, which can be really beautiful on apples when you want to kind of give it that lift, but on molasses, which as a substrate brings its own sulfur to the game, it can get a little out of hand. So I'm sure we get a subtle signature from our natural biome, but we do inoculate and that is just honestly gonna outcompete a lot of the natural yeast and bacteria. So we finish out at about 9% ABV, which is a little bit lower than a lot of rum producers, but if I ferment much higher than that, you know, we start to get stressed, they get drunk themselves. We see a higher rate of methanol coming off for us. It's just, it's the sweet spot for yield and quality is 9%. We're a tiny distillery, you know, our wash still is 3,800 liters. Our spirit still is 750 liters. We have two of them that run side by side, but we're still really tiny. So for us, it's often not the yield thing we're pushing. We're really pushing like people. It's the quality choice for us. So um, that's our fermentation um, as far as that goes. And then in the distillation, something that I love about coming to the rum world, or, you know, originally from the whiskey world and then worked at Germain Robin doing brandy. Um, at those places, you know, especially in the whiskey world, it was you had your recipe, you fermented it, you distilled it, and you often put it in the same style cooperage, especially here in North America, New American Oak, all the time. Whereas in brandy, we had different vineyards and different plots, and we would, you know, fresh wine at the start of the season distilled differently than wine that had sat through a couple months on its lees. Uh, all distilled differently, but you still sort of had the same barrel regime. You used the same still, you distilled it to the same proof. Whereas in rum, we distill marks. So one day I'll walk in and I'll have one fermentation. So our fermentations have different names for mark. You know, we have rich, we have Yankee. Uh, we have all these different names for our marks, which are different, um, you know, blends of yeast, different types of fermentations. And then there's another name on the mark, you know, thick, fine, et cetera, about how we distilled it. Uh, and then we, of course, age it in a large variety of barrels so that when we blend all these casks together, we have a lot of complexity. And that's been really good for us. So it's very different. Um, and we might have talked about this a little bit last time. You know, in the winter, we really like to distill our marks that go through our single column. Uh, so it's a single batch column. It's, you know, it's not this multi-column, whatever. Uh, we can only distill to so high a proof. Um, but uh, it allows us in that cold weather to get that extra reflux. Um, we get a cleaner, lighter, brighter, more aromatic, more linear structure on the spirit. Um, sort of like if you were in Scotland using a very tall still, uh, you would get all that reflux, the cooler air surrounding it, um, more copper contact. 
Whereas in the summer, um, we like to distill a lot of our heavier, richer, more like back palate, weighty, textural uh, style rums because it's a lot warmer. It's, I mean, it's 100 degrees here with like 75% humidity in the summer. It's hotter than the Caribbean. Um, you're just not going to get that same separation. And of course, we shut down at the high heat of summer um, to do all our maintenance and stuff. But at the same time, yeah, it changes the way the stills run. So we have a phrase at our distillery. We say, give us some which means like turn up the heat, push a little harder. You might keep your cuts the same. You might keep everything the same. But if you're really wanting that more flavor, we say give us some, uh, which is sort of a slang term from the state of Maine. If you get stuck in the mud in mud season and you want someone to hit the gas while you're pushing their car, you yell out, give us some. Uh, <laughs> I see. So that's where that <laughs> comes from. Um, so yeah, for us, it's, uh, it's, it's different depending on what mark we're trying to achieve for what style spirit we're trying to produce. So we have different, we have our house style, but then within that, those brands have their house style and they're all made of different marks and different combinations of different marks. And, you know, double pot's really in right now. So we're including a little more double pot and fortifying that stock and all that kind of stuff. Wow. You know, something something that, uh, that we started to talk about a little bit last week and then a subject that you also broached, you know, just, you know, right now as well was, um, you know, not only uh, how do the stills react to different temperatures and, and seasonality, but then also how you uh, put whiskeys, or sorry, how you put rums together uh, based on the, the seasonality as well. Something I was wondering from, from Brendan was that, you know, at, at Glen G and Ardbeg, is there a difference, um, you know, due to season and how you have to, uh, you know, treat the, still, treat the stills and operate? Yeah. So the, the, there's a difference but it's not huge. So <clears throat> you've got to remember that in Scotland, summer happens as often as winter happens in Game of Thrones. You know, it's like every 10 seasons, you'll get a hot summer. So even in the hottest summers, it's, it's not really a big deal. Now, two years ago, we had a, a, a crazy hot summer with this beautiful warm summer. So <clears throat> we did notice a difference in the spirit. Um, it's just there's less cool air around the top of the stills. There's less there's less reflux, so it becomes a little harder to do. So what we did is we dropped, we cut our production down 15% for those weeks. So that just means there's less stills running. So the stills have longer to cool down. There's less total heat in the still house. You know, you're just giving it a chance to get back around. But also what we did is we dropped back our mash size. So rather than putting 10 tons into the mash ton, I think it was 9.8 or 9.75, um, which then means you, st you fill your still less. You know, you're putting less volume into each batch. So you're opening up small amounts, but you're opening up a little bit more far. It's normally under underwater, and you're giving it an opportunity to help in the reflux process, helping the, the removal of the mercaptans, all these different sulfur compounds. So... We do that. We don't do it every year. I'll be honest with you. There's the difference is not huge. Barley, um, I, and you know my true love is barley. My wife's just through that door, which is quite a nervous comment to have made, but I think it's fine. She knows that. Um, but barley, one of the things I do love about it is it's so different and it grows in such different ways. But really, the differences in barley year to year tend to affect the yield. They don't affect the the, the ester formation or the fermentation well so much. So it's just one less variable when you're making scotch because you're 100% barley. So you don't see as extreme flips winter to summer, year to year and stuff like that. But yeah, so just at the very, very worst times, what you would do is drop production a little or wait to the height of the summer. If you have a really crazy summer, you just switch off. You would just switch and just wait for it to cool down and then you start again. You know, I was hoping that you would take the take the bait as an opportunity to speak about temperature of of, uh, of uh, condensation waters as well. Um, is, oh, right. is that another factor? Is that another factor in in terms of seasonality of, of how you are approaching distillation at both Glenmore and Gin Ardbeg? So no, um, the condensation water. So the, the 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 process water coming onto your site doesn't affect condensation because. <clears throat> try to take some of that very high temperature down. We have efficient shell and chupin exchangers on both stills, and we have after coolers. So if we need to apply a little bit of chill to water, we have after coolers. What's more important, though, is before the stills is the setting temperature. 
of our ferments, the setting temperature of our washbacks. So that gets tough in the summer. That gets really tough in the summer at our big. Um, so again, what we do is we drop our mash size a little if we have to. Um, we extend our fermentation a little if we have to, and we adjust how much yeast we pitch. Um, we just try and keep an eye. But really what it tends to do is you see a drop off in yield. So the amount of liters we make per ton. Um, sorry, this is America. The amount of hecto gizzards we make per, you know, gizzards. We know what gizzards. leaders are. Um, All right. You know. I said leaders for my soul, guys. I was like, I can do the math. So, yeah. Drinks, drinks come with leaders. It's very important. That's it. There you go. Metric system. Come on, come on. We've only got stone left. That's all we do. But, but um, you may see a 5 or 10% drop off in yield, but I don't see a flavor change. Now, again, orangey, our water is super beneficial because it's from a spring. But we talk about it being super beneficial because it comes out mineralic, you know. It's full of calcium, magnesium, it's full of phosphates, everything you need for good mashing and for great yeast function. But the other thing that's great about it is because it's just springing out of the ground and then coming to the still, it's got no time to heat up. It's got no time to get warm in the sun. So it comes out at a really steady nine degrees Celsius. So again, Celsius, here I go with these crazy units based on 100. What a crazy man. Um, <laughs> one of our 10 is in Fahrenheit. Somewhere between zero and two one two. Uh, but it comes <laughs> <laughs> it's forty eight degrees. You're good. That's thank you. Thank you. you can between zero and two one two. Um it comes out cold at Glenmorangie. So we actually get great setting temperatures at Glenmorangie, and it's just an added benefit from this flavorful mineralic water. At our bag, it's sitting at Loch Ugadal, which is like uh at least it's deep, so you get a bit of coolness, but it's a loch, you know, so if the sun's shining on it, you're gonna get some thermal pickup. And Cam's right, that presents problems, but it's more so setting your washback for fermentation than it is running your condensers. You just tend to need to use more water. So there's no there's no cooling coils in the washbacks? Uh, no, <clears throat> no cooling coils. But in the shell and tube heat exchangers, if we have single pass, this is going proper chemical engineering here, but single pass, you're turning it from a vapor back into a liquid, and then you're cooling the liquid down all in one operation. Or you can have multi-pass, where you have a certain amount of water that takes it through the latent change, which is where all the energy comes out, basically. So the latent um, heat of evaporation is enormous. And put that in reverse, it's taking it from a gas into a liquid. And then you can have a second phase where you cool down the hot liquid to a cooler liquid. But because that second phase, you would need to have a huge condenser, then you might put a tiny little chill loop in and it's called an after cooler. And we have a couple mm. of them on day. And then people think, you think, oh, that doesn't sound very energy efficient. It's actually massively energy efficient because you get this really usable, very hot water off of the first phase change. And you sacrifice a little bit of electricity to make an after cooler at the opposite end. Mm. And then you'd use that hot water in in the processes in a heat exchanger or or in a, in, in warming yeah. up. Uh, uh, the, the stills for the next run or something, or how would that Absolutely. work? Absolutely. You're always needing heat at a distillery. You always need heat at a distillery. You know, um, you need it for raising steam. You need it for distilling. Dr. Bill and I both love a hot bath, you know, and we, we insist on having them separately. So, again, it's a useful place. Um, yeah, you're, you're never, ever going to – if you face a problem of, you know, I have all this hot water and nowhere to use it, then – you're in, a, you're in a gorgeous place. If you can get high quality hot water, you're going to use it somewhere well. The problem is, is when you get this kind of warm water, you tend to get lots of warm water. That's the stuff that's hard to use, you know? Sure. And it's, uh, that reminded me of a, a follow-up question in terms of, so obviously Ardberg is for the south of water sources on the surface as opposed to spring, but um, do the wooden washbacks retain heat better than steel or is it the other way around? Uh, the wooden, wooden washbacks retain heat better. So <clears throat> when you have a swing from summer to winter, sorry, from winter to summer, um, you want to have stainless steel washbacks for purely efficiency terms because it just it lets the heat lose more easily. Um, so you have like a double whammy problem at our big. We have warmer water and we have washbacks that hold on to the heat better, mm. whereas we have two benefits probably only 
We only need one. We have this nice cool water, and then we have these stainless steel wash bags. So again, it's just it's part of what makes our bag special and unique and different. But it's also part of what makes Glenmorangie unique and special and different. And it's also just Glenmorangie Distillery. <clears throat> if I walk around that distillery and I got charged with designing a distillery that is going to make a fruity and floral clean spirit, you would put every bit of equipment that's in Glenmorangie, you would put that in. It is designed to make this incredibly complex fruity floral spirit. Um, if you were asked to make our bed to make a smoky whiskey, I don't know if you would pick all the things that are there. I certainly wouldn't design a two-to-one ratio balanced operation distillation. And I don't know if I'd have put a purifier in there either. You know, it's just there's these quirks that have happened. But with that one, these quirks have added up to making this, you know, like it or hate it, love it or hate it, is our bag. Whereas at Glenmorangie, it really is every single thing that's there, Dan. It, it's just a dream of a distillery to, you know, to have... Because the spirit quality is just, just so good. It's just so perfect. We, uh, we've got a couple of questions in the chat room. One of them is uh, that uh, the fermentation distillation run two years ago when the temperature was uh, of significance uh, and you had to change things at both Glamour and Ardbeg. Mike, uh, one of my pals here in Omaha, oh, that's the boss. That's the that's the main thing. Um, was any of that distillate from was any of that distillate from that year uh, saved for experimenting? Obviously, you can probably not be able to divulge that, but I'm guessing there was at least the thought of it. So, so I don't know if you'd say was it saved for experimenting. It depends what you mean, but definitely some of our spirit went out of character, especially in Glenmorangie, which is so unusual because I've just said every bit of equipment pulls it to where we need it to be. But what we do is. Um, we mark the casks. So I nosed the new make spirit and I could tell it was just had a tiny bit of um, too much grassiness and not enough fruitiness. So I don't think the fruitiness dropped down. I just think the grassiness came up and it was just a little bit, it wasn't sulfury, but it was just, it had a tiny bit grippiness to it, almost in the palate, but it was just, you could tell there was something in there underneath all the fresh, light and beautiful, there was something sitting underneath there. It just wasn't quite what we were wanting. But it's still single malt whiskey from Glenmondia and it's still fantastic. It's just not to the character that I expected. So what we do is we mark the casks. Now back in the old days you would physically mark the casks, you know? But we just have like a I was going to say we have like modern IT but Glenmondia Company was founded in 1843 and you know, we were always pioneers. We invested in our ID department in 1844. And I think that was it. We didn't really advance beyond there. Um, I hope none of the IT department are watching right now or I'm in trouble. But to be honest, I don't think we know how to work the internet. Oh, I've done it again. <laughs> I'm joking, of course, but we have a little database for tracking our, our stocks. It's quite simple. I think it's access-based or something. And what we do is we just mark, mark next to them saying, you know, uh, not the spirit we were looking for, but it's 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 shades out, you know. It's not hugely different. It's not come out tasting like our bag. It just tastes like Glenmorangie with a background note. So what we'll do is we'll watch them. We will sample them more often. Uh, we also make some decisions on what casks they go into. So quite a lot of them went into first fill ex bourbons because we think it will benefit from that. Uh, and maybe in ten years' time, do you know what? Maybe it will course correct, but. Say it's, say it's just off this way and as the maturation happens it comes back on target then fantastic and we'll use it but say it's off this way and it continues to go you know so a lot of distillers are think, oh no what are we going to do but that's where Dr Bill and I are thinking yes let's see where this goes let's see where this crazy journey is let's see where this car crash crashes and then <laughs> let's see what we can do with it you know so it could turn into this spectacular thing where Ten years from now, we're talking about this hot summer in Scotland, or or maybe it'll just course correct and come back in. So right now, it's not it's not marked for a destiny right now, but it's not even legally whiskey yet, you know, until it has three years. So sure, have time, we have time to figure I, it out. I would love to hear Maggie's take on uh, <laughs> on outlier distillates and how they are course corrected, or if they're even you know uh, if they even need course correction uh, to to be utilized by you yeah um yeah so i remember just a comment on the vintages i remember 
2003 was a really, really, really hot year, especially in Europe and wine growing regions. And I saw a little vertical of Armagnac back in like, you know, a while ago in the before times, which is all just a blur now. Uh, and I bought the 03, the 05, and then one of the like kind of more off years, like a 07. And I remember tasting like what I noticed in wine and hot vintages in the distillate as well. It was kind of cool um, to see. But of course, um, blending is a big part of all that we do. So um, we're really fortunate that we don't have too many outlying spirits. We're pretty good at targeting what are our barrel inventories at? What do we want to be making, et cetera? And of course, as they age, tasting and reassigning. Whoa, this is maturing and opening up. Lovely, great. This is really tight and knit and not opening. And it's very firm and it's gonna take longer than we thought. Readjust uh, where these are headed. Uh, this one, you know, the oak is really kind of clobbering it in a way I didn't expect. Let's transfer it to a once used brandy cask to kind of open it up and flush it out. Let's do this, let's do that. It's kind of all the cask management we do that you know is one of my worst habits from the cognac tradition. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so for us, there's always coaxing it along. Um, so there's a balance between what is my intention for this and what is it telling me it's going to be, and drawing that line. You know, can I coax this along and let it remain something that would be bottled as our navy yard rum, which is you know, single cast, cask strength, new American oak, full throttle expression. Or is this really too juicy and fruity and, you know, supple on the palate? It doesn't have that firmness. It doesn't have that knit linear structure that we're really looking for in the Navy Yard expression. Great. This can be a blending tool in our New England Reserve. Or this is something really cool and different. Let's release it under our distiller's drawer series or put it out on offer as a single barrel. Uh, for someone who wants to purchase their own rum. Um, so we kind of are very much always watching and kind of funneling. And I learned a lot from port blenders about this and how they bring in a vintage. The quality of the vintage is of a certain expectation. And that means they have an understanding of where they can fill in their stocks, um, you know, and, and how they approach that. And then the next vintage might be really great. And so they're like, great, let's intend for this all to be vintage port. Okay, these different lots aren't quite up to the task. Let's reconstitute them as late bottle vintage. Okay, no, this is really, really great distillate and it can work in our 40 year tawny and we see tawny trends going up. And, and sort of how they work and champagne blenders. A, a lot of them taught me a lot about this how do you watch something that you have an intention for and refile it and reorganize it and reevaluate it honestly and openly into the direction it needs to go? And so kind of working with that's definitely part of the joy of being a little bit smaller of a distillery. Um, you know, we have about a thousand barrels. It's pretty easy for us to kind of watch where they're all going. And, and mm -hmm. you know, of course you can get bigger with a team. Um, and that's why we have such a strong team at Privateer as we sort of expand our distilling operations there. Very cool. <clears throat> um, that, that brings up an interesting point. Uh, one of the reasons that we started doing this thing in general, uh, Highlands to Islands, was not necessarily just to look at how Glamorgy and Ardberg are different, but how those two distilleries and all the other distilleries that, that we uh, have access to or think about or whatever, are at least in some ways subject to the whims of nature, uh, the amount to which you can't control a thing and the amount to which you make adjustments for the amount to which you can't control a thing. Uh, that bit of it, uh, like Brandon mentioned uh, early in the show, the art of it, um, that's the that's uh, one of the biggest elements that I think uh, you know the two of us and obviously everybody involved in the industry finds really fascinating. Um, this, the ideas that we've been discussing mostly in terms of the production of single malt scotch whiskey, obviously there are going to be some parallels in how American whiskeys are, are made, but there can be some distinct differences in terms of still configuration and structure and, and the, uh, the traditions involved. Lou, you've been around the country a jillion times looking at uh, uh, bourbon rye distilleries. Brennan, you're involved with Woodenville. Maggie, you've done some whiskey distilling here in the U.S. So you're looking at 
Uh, yes, uh, obviously uh, a, a different microclimate. So there's going to be more temperature extremes between summer and winter. So that's going to create some differences. But the thing like uh, like uh, doublers and retorts, uh, deflemitis, the kinds of things that you wouldn't see in Scotland. What's up with that? I mean, where did those where did those come from? Uh, and and what is being attempted when you add something in series like uh, like a thumper, uh, a thumper or uh, a retort? I mean, I get the general theory of it, but why is that a thing that happened here and not in Scotland? You want to start, Lou, with a uh, whiskey thumpers, and then I can talk rum retorts. <laughs> You're on mute. Oh, I got you. Mute. Um, yeah, I can start that. Uh, I mean, the, the the tendency, I think, in American whiskey was to go, uh, and I'm talking back in the 1800s, the tendency was to just I mean, run it and, and sell it, you know, just get the money. But when you started to get a, um, you know, you started to see a separation after roughly in the period after the Civil War between people who are, trying to make better whiskey and people who are trying to make more money. Um, and you eventually get to the point where the people who are trying to make more money are really strictly focused on that. And I think that's when you start seeing um, improvement in still technology, um, changes in still technology. You're trying to clean up the spirit. Um, because when you clean up the spirit in, in distillation, it becomes you know less of a what less of a gamble when you put it in the barrel um so your i mean your doubler is essentially taking crap out of the whiskey um uh, it's a technical term um because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I remember um asking uh one of the, this is one of the questions i came up with in the book the book was a great chance to ask all the things that i'd always wondered about and never really had a chance to, to get into um one of them was, you know, when you're running a stripper column, what, uh, where, where, do, where do the feints and the four shots go? I mean, because there aren't any because of how you're running it, but you're still looking to get that stuff out of it. And obviously some of it comes out in the head, but some of it also comes out in the doubler. And, and that stuff is in the, in the doubler water. And I, you know, I inevitably started thinking of the doubler water as bond water because it was just nasty stuff that you didn't want to get on you. Um, but that and the defogmator, uh, which I still have a hard time pronouncing, um, they're just awkward syllables to put together. Uh, that is more about the defogmator is more about, um, running the still, like how hard you're running it. Are you, are you giving it some, are you horsing it? Is that what you said? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I mean, it surprised me. I always thought a column still was a set it and forget it kind of thing, but you can, I mean, you can mess with it. Um, you run more, more cold water up there in the top and the, and you run, run your wash in at a different temperature. You want your, cause you've got a beer heater, uh, before you put it in, you, you put the steam in at more or less pressure. Um, you can adjust that in, on how fast you're running the still and you can adjust to, to climate differences. But it's all about getting to a, 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 a more consistent spirit, um, a, a cleaner spirit, a spirit the way you want it. Is there any, and this just occurred to me, is there any analogy to be drawn between how, uh, how whiskey production in the U.S. evolves and how much column stills change the game in Scotland? Uh, since everybody was making basically uh, pot still whiskey until uh, until Robert Stein and, and A.S. Coffee came along. And then that thing happened. The blenders decided what they wanted. And then the distillers were sort of put under pressure to make that thing. Is there, is, is there, is, is that an example? Is that the Galapagos Islands example of whiskey evolution? <laughs> or are those two completely different uh, and un, I, I, not? I, I actually find a more apt comparison, I think, to the um, uh, how things evolved in Irish whiskey and in, in Lowland Scottish whiskey with the, the huge, you know, make a batch of whiskey in, in 45 minutes thing. Um, where in, uh, I mean, if you look at a, at a, at a straight-up coffee still, 
mean, it's not a Kentucky column still. That was one of the right. things that, I mean, that held me up for years trying to think, well, that they're column stills, but they aren't. They're different. Um, and I think that's where, you know, you have a, um, a thing that is designed to make a lot of uh, simple whiskey. And then you have a thing that is designed to make spirit, to make whiskey, to make bourbon um, or, or rye. Uh, and I mean, you know, the other thing, you know, we look at it now and we, we, we can't help having this. And I run into this, I read about beer as well. And I run into the same thing with brewing. We look at what brewing is today or in our lifetime memory and we think, this is the way it's always been. And when we get away from that, we're doing a bad thing. But we're not. It's it's always changed. Beer styles have been constantly evolving. A stout now is not what a stout was 50 years ago. And that's different from what that was 100 years before that. Whiskey is the same way. Distilling is the same way. And, you know, we look at these uh, stripper stills, the beer stills that are used in the industry now. And... I mean, I was just uh, talking to Todd Leopold last week, who's running, who has had Vendome build him one of the old three chamber stills. And that's a completely different way of going at whiskey, something that we've lost, that we, we don't even know how to make anymore. And they, and you know, he's had one built from old plans and he's learning how to use it, which in turn reminds, and I'm sorry, I realize I'm going on a way far off tangent here. No, no, that's great. Love it. There's a, <laughs> it's this interesting comparison I read between barbecue and moonshine in that we recognize easily that we have all these different regional styles of barbecue. There's Virginia Q, there's North Carolina Q, South Carolina Q, there's lowland and highland North Carolina Q. Some of it's sauce, some of it's technique, some of it's... Um, what meat they use. I mean, Owensboro, Kentucky has a tradition of lamb barbecue. Uh, mutton, actually, excuse me. Um, but the same thing existed in uh, moonshining. They used different kinds of stills on the front slope of the Appalachian, on the back slope of the Appalachians, and it got hammered so much by uh, revenues in the 50s that those differences disappeared, and it's all just, you know, essentially where we were in late late 1800s with bourbon. It's just make spirit and get it out the door before somebody comes in the front. Hmm. Um, so I think that, you know, when we got down to what, seven bourbon makers, a lot of variety went away because we all, we just had that, those things and all the other ways of making it, all the other thoughts about it were assumed to not be good because they failed. And I mean, <laughs> Lots of good things fail. Uh, good whiskey makers are not always good, good business people. Um, good whiskey is not always loved by the people who drink whiskey, or at least not enough of us. Um, and I think that has as much to do with it as anything else. I think it's just sometimes it's something as stupid and simple as business trends. Yeah. I'm sorry, I really did just kind no, of wander off on that. It's beautiful. Right? I love great. it. And it... It makes me think of like one of my favorite, most beautiful things about entering the rum world is we talked about this a little last week, like the history of the stills that are on the islands in the Caribbean is just the history of stills as they became available. And like you see every type of still and every type of configuration, you have to know how every type of still works from stacked clay pots to, you know, in Haiti, a hot water heater that's been repurposed to <laughs> continuous bed, five column, multi column, which is a lot of the rum on the market is, you know, kind of like flavored vodka, not gonna lie, uh, down to these intense, dirty retorts uh, that give you really badass flavor. Um, I made a little drawing for the retort. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, nice. Oh, the, the thing that helps with the retorts is that they're very simple. They're simple shapes. Um, and it allows you to do a single distillation and get that exactly. Thank you, Cam. Oh, there we oh, go. Oh, that's a good one. Hey, this looks like an electric bong I had planned when I was in college. <laughs> um, like I, love it. I love it. The pump. 
And the idea is to get um, multiple distillations in a single run. So, you know, if you do a single distillation, you get 45% ABV, it's not really want. But if you go through a couple retorts, like two retorts, you're up around the 89%. And when you charge those retorts, so the liquid that's in there, so the vapor is kind of coming in through a pipe and going into a liquid and then bubbling up through, as Lou said, you get another layer of separation, more impurities are left behind, and also you're creating a whole new chemical interaction, a different solution. As a solution changes, it distills differently, right? So the solution in your pot is changing as you distill, and then your solution within these retorts are changing as you distill. And so you're coaxing out different elements, and one is charged with high wines, and one is charged with low wines, which have different definitions than American whiskey. Um, so like, it would be more like faints and four shots, uh, and other stuff, but, uh, it kind of creates different aromas and different characters. So not only are you getting a layer of separation and efficiency without having to do a separate, another distillation, you could do a one-time distillation, but you're picking up and creating and coaxing flavor and utilizing some of what would be waste to enhance your next distillation. Um, and so that becomes really important. It's particularly important in Jamaican rum distilling. And you see some in Barbados, Foursquare has a great one. Um, but I do think that it's not all rums made everywhere. You know, you've got Creole, Column, and Martinique. You've got the big mega producers um, using the big multi-columns. You've got pot stills from Forsyth. You know, it's pretty amazing the variety of stills that you experience and know in the rum world, um, just as creating a variety of styles. You know, what's interesting is that that image that I that I just held up was Worthy Park, which we mentioned last week, which we mentioned last week, um, you know, my visit there last year, uh, you know, I, I make a pilgrimage to Jamaica basically every year for, for Carnival uh, and decided to go out to, to Worthy Park. I did find it interesting that, you know, I was able to pick out the Forsyth emblem and I was like, that's a Forsyth Scottish like pop skip still that's attached to a double retort system. Um, and then if you might have noticed, this is something about all the additions. So you have the Forsyth pot still attached to these retorts. And then out of the retort, there's actually a four plate super mini column mm -hmm. that's in there as really? well. And so it's like, you want to talk about all the parts you can put together and that mini column, it has a day flick meter. No, oh, of course it does. Because <laughs> why so, wouldn't yeah, it? Sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Right. Right. I was like, sorry to interrupt your beautiful story. But it's like, this is this is how Caribbean stills are built. I'll, I'll be in Appleton and I'll be like, is that then go full site? Uh, they're all welded together. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. Sorry, Camp, go ahead. Like no, that's exactly what I was, yeah, that's exactly what I was hoping to, to get out of you is like, why? Why is it that you see these Franken stills, uh, as Brendan has kind of put it, in, in the rum world? Um, is it, does it really have to do with uh, availability of, of the component pieces? Is there a, a little bit of the history of, uh, of colonization that, that seeps its way into that as well? I mean, because Jamaica itself has a, uh, has a, a history with Scotland where Scotland owned about 30% of the slave trade that passed through. So to me, it's not insane to see Scottish, um, uh, you know, pieces of, of distillation, you know, take effect yeah. and take root in, in, in that island. Yeah. Absolutely. And the Creole column in Martinique, you know, the co colonization by the French using this Armagnac type still. Um, absolutely. You're right. This is why I don't use a nomenclature that this is a Spanish style rum. This is a British style rum. I think that's disrespectful and inaccurate and erases the labor of the people who are doing the work. You know, I think we talked about this. Jamaica is not British, guys. Uh, Puerto Rican's not part of Spain. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, but there is a context historically that does shed some light on the processes and why you see what you do where. Why do you see the brand word Solera, which to be clear in spirits, Solera is not the same as the one third fractional expectation people might be expecting. Um, but you see that word, you know, associated with places that were colonized by, you know, Spanish forces often. And, and why do you see that there? Why do you see these retorts in these four slices of Barbados and Jamaica? And, and I think you're spot on. I think there's a history of colonialization, the history of those styles, what people have made for themselves out of it, like Worthy Park, Jamaican owned and operated. I love it. Um, and, you know, I think that it's really important to see all those different things and, 
and how they do all come together. And in Haiti, I mean, Haiti, when we, you know, I, every conference, I feel like I end up telling someone to like Google reparations, Haiti to France, like the amount of money that they had to pay to France in reparations for their own freedom is appalling. And, you know, they have been systematically kept from progress, which is really fascinating in the rum world today because they have such ancestral techniques that now that's what people want. And, you know, you see these really big producers in, you know, um, Word and Barbados, you know, like people who have like, you know, big brands and big volumes and potentially all these multi columns making, you know, more neutral, less artisanal styles. And you get instead like these tiny growers, they can tell you exactly the sugarcane varietal that is in it, which is unlike anywhere else. Um, you know, small farmers, small producers, they're literally like boiling the sugar with these wooden paddles to separate out crystals. It's unbelievable. Um, all wood fired um, that you see that people are now excited about, but it's just because they were denied access to progress for so long, which is a heartbreaking other side of the coin, right? So I do think that the history of colonialization in the Caribbean touches everything that happens in rum. It touches everything that happens in a lot of stuff we handle, you know, gin, whiskey, mm -hmm. uh, but in, in rum, it's right on the surface. And I think that's actually a good thing that we address it and talk about it, but absolutely what stills you'll see where definitely have part of, you know, who was there, who was bringing money, who was in control of the distillation, who was making the choices. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. You know, I think that there is a, a, a another link that even ties back into Scotland, um, uh, uh, specifically up in the highlands of Scotland, where where sugar was a, a massive commodity uh, that that was traded and and sold by grocers. These same grocers went on to be some of the most iconic blenders in, in Scotch whiskey as well. So there's an interesting link to be talked about, um, you know, but between uh, how Scottish stills and how stills of, of a wide swath uh, ended up wherever in the world that they did, but then also how those exports of things like sugar also influenced the whiskey world around us as well. Yeah, absolutely. Huge, hugely. And, you know, in Bordeaux, not far from Cognac, was a massive slave trade port. Lots of, like, work going through there. Um, it's not insignificant in its impact in the Cognac region as well. Um, even though we like to think of those things as separate from these issues, it's not, it, it touches, you know, everything. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that occurred to me when, uh, <clears throat> when we were talking about, when Louie, when you were talking about uh, sort of the, uh, the evolution of distillation from a, th a thing you sort of did and guessed at, to a thing that you did a little bit of guesswork, a, a little bit less guesswork with these passing generation, kind of feeds into this this uh, this globalization uh, and colonization uh, idea. Um, the the application of the of uh, the applied science aspect of the making of whiskey. So uh, James Crow gets credited with uh, with uh, being the first to really apply scientific method to creating whiskey in the U.S. But he was a Scotsman. Uh, so you know, the, it, how, do you, it, or Harriet Watt, or what? What you and Bill are doing at uh, at Glamorgy, There, there is uh, this increasing applied science element that I think uh, has obviously had a, a tremendous impact on the evolution of the whiskey industry. But it also there's also an element of the the, the globalized aspect of uh, shared and applied knowledge. What you know, the effect of uh, Scottish whiskey producing knowledge on the Japanese whiskey industry. Uh, those are all uh, really, uh, really big, interesting, long story arcs uh, that I think are, are are worth certainly. Cam, I'm just taking notes on future shows. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, ooh, what do we talk about next? <laughs> I love it. This all started when Lou said, "I'm just going to go on a little tangent," and you went, "Sure, go for it." <laughs> now, politics and all sorts yeah. of other stuff. Brilliant. Yeah. No, no, that's, I, I think it's a lot of, and, you know, uh, what you guys are doing with, uh, is it, is it safe to talk about the Lighthouse Project or am I going to get busted by everybody? Um, okay. uh, anyway, it's dedicated to research. It's dedicated to uh, fermentation distillation research. Uh, and I think that that it's a bit like, well, you know, we're part of MH and MH talks a lot about uh, champagne. Uh, and the, the amount of research that the folks at, uh, at Clico and uh, Martin Shandon have done and then shared 
uh, with the broader inter industry, I think, is is a big part of how Champagne's evolved. Uh, I think what we'll be doing, uh, what you guys will be doing in the Lighthouse will certainly influence and inform how the industry moves forward from there. What, uh, you know, the, the legacy, Glenmo's had a legacy of doing things first, but uh, uh, not, clearly not all the things, uh, the sorts of things that are happening all over Scotland, all over the, all over the US, all over any distilling nation that take this fundamentally somewhat simple concept and take it in a jillion different directions. Uh, I just find that stuff fascinating, uh, which and it reminded me. So, correct, just clear up a little bit of uh, uh, confusion on my part. If a, a, a retort and a thumper is uh, basically the same thing, kind of, but you're looking to recapture some of the usable alcohol from uh, from the uh, four shots and faints, basically. But it's also those things aren't independently heated, are they? They're using the latent heat coming over from the from the run before. So it's yeah. a it's also an efficient use of heat energy uh, at the same time is that, and uh, increased, co increased copper contact, uh, an increased uh, amount of extraction of usable alcohol from your overall uh, uh, distillate and a recapturing of, of heat resource. Is that, am I off on any of that or is that kind of where we're at? Okay. That's where you're at. It's also, I know good. that in, yeah, in Scotland, you might have your separate um, faints holding tank and you might, strike the specific proof to get the, the the separation and then to decant off and recharge and you don't have to do any of that you just throw it right in and it makes um the process a lot less technical and a lot faster because if you think about you know being a colonized place you were not necessarily treated as we're trying to make this national heritage thing it was we are trying to make money off of you and money very quickly um, and that's where you see in the Caribbean, also the presence of three chamber stills. Uh, there's a couple still there uh, where it is just load the next still, load the next still, load the next still, drop, 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 push through, through, through. Um, and it, that's kind of how it ends up working is just trying to really work those enslaved people as hard as they could to extract as much wealth as possible. Wow. That's, um, that's- I'm so cheerful, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> We're real in rum. That's good. Happy Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's this is fantastic. why I get the nickname Killjoy Campbell. It's good. It's fine. <laughs> but it's not even alliterative. Once one's a K and one's a C. That doesn't right. you can't really. Oh just my god. That. Oh, god. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the sound. It doesn't matter it's how so it's spelled. Damn it. <laughs> I'll let the writer decide. I'll let the writer decide. <laughs> Fair enough. We're we're coming up on the hour. I just wanted to uh, obviously, uh, if anybody's got any last comments that we're, that you feel like we haven't cut out, cover covered uh, thoroughly enough, please let me know. Um, but wanted to thank you all a tremendous amount for being a part of this thing. Your your uh, luminaries in the industry and the wealth of knowledge uh, in your three heads could fill volumes and volumes and volumes. So we're Cam and I. I don't want to speak for you, Cam, but uh, I am. Uh, we're thoroughly honored to have spent this hour with you uh, talking about all these things. We would love to uh, have any or all of you on again at some point. We're, we'll be talking about loads of different funky concepts moving forward. Um, but uh, thanks very, very much. Uh, Lou, you've got the two books. You've got Tasting Whiskey and uh, and that one, Whiskey Masterclass, that are out currently. You can you can find those on Amazon. They are uh, total game changers. I think anybody anybody uh, who's coming up in the industry on the distributor side or on the on the supplier side that ever contacts me about, okay, what do I do? What books should I just Tasting Whiskey? Go buy Lou Bryson's books, <laughs> and you'll be okay. You know, it's it's sort of a one stop Thanks. shop of the things that you need to know in order to progress uh, in the industry from the education and advocacy side, uh, from the sales side, from the production side. They're 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 absolute how tos. Uh, Maggie, you you're clearly changing the paradigm every day that you go to work. Uh, you do some amazing stuff. The uh, the four to five star reviews you keep getting from uh, from Paul Packold. Uh, that's 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 amazing. Uh, Brendan, clearly you're part of uh, a game changing team. Uh, that, that's that's bringing such amazing uh, amounts of innovation and just superb whiskeys uh, into the discussion uh, at, at both Glamorgy and Ardbeg. Uh, Brennan is MCC underscore Brennan on Instagram. Maggie is Half Pipe uh, Maggie on uh, Instagram. And Lou Bryson is, of course, Lou Bryson 
on Instagram. Cam's got his show on Mondays and Fridays, uh, Whiskey Through Food. That is a 5 p.m. Eastern uh, live presentation combining food, whiskeys, and whiskey cocktails, which I think is completely fascinating. We're here on Tuesdays, uh, every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern uh, time talking about whiskey stuff. Uh, so thanks everybody for joining us on the live show. We, uh, we hope that people tune into the recorded broadcast because I'm going to with several notebooks in hand and trying to make sure I don't get right as crap from all the things that we've covered off on. Uh, but uh, thanks, everyone. Cam. Do you have anything that you want to that you want to get out there? No, absolutely nailed it all. Uh, it was fantastic to to be on this with with such incredible personalities and truly luminaries in the industry. Huge amount of respect and, and love for all of you. Uh, again, thank you, thank you so much for for being a part of it. And I, and Maggie had a Maggie had a thing she had to do right at uh, right at three Eastern. So we thank her so much for being a part of this. Lou Brennan, uh, again, an absolute pleasure. Uh, hopefully, we'll have you on again at some point. Uh, but uh, good health and great whiskey to both of you. All right, guys, great show. Take care. Thank See you. you soon. Good to see you guys.